welcome, welcome everybody, um, and Happy New Year. Um, thank you for joining us today at the ZOA Book Club. Uh, I'm here, I'm Liz Burney, together uh, with my colleagues, Alan Jay and, and Sharona Whistler, who are our co-hosts today. And I would first like to uh, turn this over to Marty Gross, uh, who is a great friend of ZOA, and he'll give us a little introduction, and then we'll introduce uh, Rebecca Abrams. Marty, please go ahead. Okay, well, thank you everybody for coming on the call. Um, I'm, I'm so glad ZOA holds these types of events. Um, the event today is it's about a book, Jewish Treasures from Oxford Libraries. And I'll very briefly give you a little bit of background and then turn it over to Rebecca. Um, in 2012, I went to an exhibit at the Jewish Museum in New York, and I saw a number of very, very interesting Hebrew manuscripts and other books that included um, a Maimonides manuscript and many others, and the Maimonides manuscript actually had changes in it in his own handwriting. So um, by, by way of background, um, I know a bit about Jewish history. I'm a book collector, and I never knew that all of these collections were at Oxford, even though I had studied there. So I said to myself, I wonder whether the story of how these collections ever got to the Bodleian Library and some Oxford colleges, whether that story had ever been told. I found out that it really had not been told. Um, and I started uh, contacting some people um, at Oxford to see who might think that writing a book, telling those stories would be a good idea. Okay, so lucky for me and everyone else, mm -hmm. um, I was introduced to Rebecca, um, who um, has a wonderful position at Brazenose College, which she will tell you about if she gives, allows, I will allow her to tell you a little bit about her background. So the short story is that um, the story of how these manu books and manuscripts and these collections got to um, where they are at Oxford um, is now told in this wonderful book called Jewish Treasures. So um, with that, let me turn it over to Rebecca, who will tell you about the content of the book. Um, she'll tell you a bit about how it came to be that uh, she worked with people to get the book done, including the Bali and Press. Um, and go into a lot of the content of it. So clearly, we, we obviously want you to know you can buy it on Amazon. Um, and um, especially if you use our name, I'm sure they will not give you a discount. Because <laughs> we already sold a lot of that. But anyway, it's a great book. Um, and let me just turn this over to Rebecca, who can take you through um, how it was done. And I will say that while it might be true, and it is true, that I kind of came up with the idea and my foundation funded it, this never would have happened had Rebecca not done what she did by taking the reins, um, becoming one of the two editors who uh, really saw to it that this happened. And so we really owe it to Rebecca that this book exists. So there you go, Rebecca. Take it from there. All right. Oh, thank you, Marty. I just wanted to first give everybody a brief bio of Rebecca. Um, sure. Rebecca Abrams is an award-winning writer, editor, teacher, and journalist based in Oxford, England. She's the author of seven works of fiction and nonfiction. She teaches creative and academic writing at the University of Oxford and is a regular literary critic for the Financial Times. Her publications include The Jewish Journey, 4,000 Years in 22 Objects, described by one reviewer as a celebration of Jewish life in all its worldly immensity, and a forthcoming book about the medieval Jewish businesswoman, Licoricia of Winchester. I hope I pronounced it, <laughs> pronounced Licoricia correctly. <laughs> Her most recent book, published in May 2020, which we're discussing today, is Jewish Treasures from Oxford Libraries, co-edited with Cesar Mishan Haman. And it's currently on the list for the UK's prestigious Wingate Literary Prize. And according to uh, Professor David Stern at Harvard <laughs> University, it's vivid, lavishly produced, and fascinating, a triumph of bookmaking, and we'll all see that that is definitely the case today. Thank you. Complete. Rebecca, please go ahead. Hi. Well, um, hello, everybody. Marty, thank you very much for that very generous introduction, and Liz, for yours as well, and thank you for inviting me to talk to you. And um, I'm, I should just tell anyone who's listening, I'm sitting in 
very dark, cold, gloomy Oxford at the moment. We're all in lockdown. We've been put back in lockdown. <laughs> but it's a great pleasure to talk to a, a, a Jewish American organization because apart from anything else, you say my surname right. <laughs> Whereas no one in England can ever say Abraham's right for some reason. So thank you very much for that. And, um, and yeah, let me just pick up where, where Marty left off with how this book came about. Um, you know, we're, we're immensely proud of it um, for several reasons. And one of them addresses the question Avron Miller has just actually put in the chat, which is why did Oxford suddenly decide to publish this collection after all the collection had been there for a long time? And it certainly had. I mean, the collection um, started with Thomas Bodley back in the um, 17th century, the very beginning of the 17th century. And you might well ask, why has it taken until now for the Bodleian Library to publish a book? Um, and I think, um, well, part of the answer is just Oxford University moves at a very glacial pace. You know, it does things kind of slowly. It's not in a rush. I don't think it's changed its curriculum very much in the last you know, sort of six or seven hundred years. So um, it just takes its time to get to things is, is one answer. Um, I think the other thing is that um, sometimes the, you know, the library has a lot of things it's doing. And maybe the, the Judaica, the Hebrew and Jewish collections weren't sort of uppermost in their minds in terms of a, a publishing opportunity and, a, and actually a publishing necessity. I mean, Martin, Marty Gross felt that. I think that's fair to say, Marty. And, um, and as soon as I heard about the idea, it seemed to me a complete no brainer as well. Why? Because this is one of the greatest collections of Jewish books and manuscripts in the world. It's one of the top collections in the world. Um, it's bo both in terms of its quantity and its quality. Um, so it's it's really special collection, and it's true that really um, primarily it's been attended to by librarians, collectors, scholars. Um, it, it isn't very well known beyond academe, and what was very important to me right from the start was that we find a way to make these these amazing collections accessible to the general public. Um, so if I actually, I might, I might just go straight to a screen share now and start to show you, you all some of the amazing things that are in these collections and talk you through them a little bit. Um, so if you'll just bear with me. Um, uh, okay. So if I go to that, are you seeing the screen share now? Yes, perfectly. Great, okay. So, um, um, we needed, I think Oxford needed somebody like, like Marty Gross to come along and say, hey guys, why don't you do this book? <laughs> um, and then um, as soon as I heard about it, as I said, it seemed to me um, really obvious that we had to do this book. Um, the, the, this particular image that we've put on the cover, um, we had a wonderful designer um, and, uh, uh, and photographer, you know, again, the, the book is visually very lavish and that's one of the things that's beautiful about it because these manuscripts are locked down in the libraries to an extent. Um, so we wanted to make them accessible to everybody. So the visual aspect of the book is very important. The image you're looking at comes from one of the collections called the Michael Collection. And the word, I'm sure you know, it basically says then. And we did have a discussion about whether this would be a good image to put on the cover or not, because what does it mean? It doesn't really mean anything. And also in many ways, it's a very Germanic, um, medieval Germanic image rather than a specifically Jewish one, apart from the Hebrew lettering. But I felt that the, 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 the word then actually had something very important to say about what the vision was for this book, which was um, to talk about thenness um, and nowness and what these manuscripts meant at the time when they were collected and what they mean now for people looking at them now, studying them, enjoying them, um, whatever, whatever reasons they might be looking, looking at these manuscripts now. Um, so when I say what did they mean then, this was always part of, of Marty's vision for the book, and it was one I completely was on board for, which was that we shouldn't just look at the manuscripts. We should also look at the collections. We should look at the manuscripts as the collections in which they're organized, and also tell the stories of who the collectors were, because that's such an important story that hasn't really been told very much before. And I should say that of the 10 collections we look at, uh, eight, uh, well, maybe seven, we could say seven, um, were not collected by, by, they're not collections that were put together by Jewish collectors. They were, they were collected by Christians. And I think that's kind of an important part of the story because as David Stern said in his very um, generous review of the book in Mosaic magazine, you know, we, we're very aware of how often Christians have destroyed Jewish manuscripts, but perhaps we also, you know, need to take a moment to remember actually the role they played in preserving really important Jewish manuscripts. So, um, this is the page from the Michael manuscript, the Michael collection that it comes from. Um, and it's, um, 
uh, it's from the tripartite Matsor, early 14th century, and you can see just the image a bit more clearly here. Um, it's just, this is just to give you more detail. Oh, 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 yeah. But um, but just to go back to the kind of history of how the collection started and Avram Miller's question about, you know, how long have these manuscripts, these manuscripts been there? Um, well, they've been there, as I said, since the very beginning of the 17th century. And the, the, they came into the very first collector was, in fact, Thomas Bodley, after whom the Bodleian Library is named. And he was absolutely determined from the very start that Hebrew manuscripts should be part of the collection for his library. He wanted a great humanist library. Um, and the very first manuscript that came into the library was a copy of, a, 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 a copy of Genesis. Um, and this was the second um, manuscript that was, that was brought into the, Bod the very, very new Bodleian Library collection. Um, it's a book of Ezekiel, early Jewish, uh, Anglo-Jewish, early 13th century. And what's interesting about it is you've got Latin, French and uh, Hebrew all on the same page. So it also tells us something very important about Anglo um, Jewish uh, Norman relations at that time and the kind of interactions between Christian scholars and, and Jewish scholars and scribes. Um, so it's a kind of valuable manuscript in its own right, but it's also kind of very precious because it was one of the very first uh, manuscripts that ended up in the Bodleian Library. Um, and then the 17th century went on and it was just a phenomenally exciting time for these collections. So you have um, a number of different people um, who were actively um, and kind of in a sense compulsively collecting uh, in the 17th century which is really the, where the kind of the, the the base of this phenomenal collection comes from and I just wanted to show you a few images to give you a sense of um, the, the visual range as well as the you know they're, they're, they're very diverse these collections both in terms of the languages that they're in the styles of, of illustration what they actually are as well so this is from the Lord collection I'll talk a little bit about Lord in a minute um, it's a guide, the guide, Maimonides Guide for the Perplex, and it's a Hebrew translation. Um, he, he, very different styling. This is another bit of Maimonides we have from the Huntington collection, the, the Mishnah Torah, probably from Fustat. Um, so one of the other jo joys about this huge uh, Judaica collection is you get different manuscripts in different collections, which then come together, like these different... Um, <laughs> different uh, manuscripts from Maimonides' work um, and then they, they, they kind of come, they, they, have a, they have their own life, they come together in new and interesting ways. Um, this is another example from the Huntington collection, also 17th century, it's a Quran, so they weren't only collecting um, Hebrew manuscripts by any, by, any, by any sense, in any sense, they, they, were, they, were, they, were, they were avid collectors, they were very interested in, um, in Arabic and Hebrew and Aramaic and a, a whole range of different things. Um, this is a detail, so you can just see the kind of beauty and the skill of this, uh, this manuscript. Um, but of course, I think also just going back to that, because what's interesting about it is it's a Quran it's a written in Hebrew letters. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a, it, it, was by, it was being used by Jews. Um, a very different um, kind of image here from the Kennecott collection, one of the absolute jewels of the, of the Bodleian Library is the, this Kennecott Bible, it's called Hebrew Bible Kennecott I from Corona in the 15th century. Um, lovely, I mean, very beautiful um, illustrations around the borders, but also these kind of Moorish arches, you know. So I think the collections speak visually to the diversity of uh, Jewish life. Um, so there's the, there's the lives behind there's the life of the manuscripts and there's the lives behind the manuscripts. Here's another example, again, a very different uh, style visually which really reminds us of Jewish, the diversity of Jewish life and the different places in which it was taking place. This is Rashi's commentary on the Pentateuch in the Canonici collection, Italian uh, 14th century, late 14th century. Um, so just, I mean, just as an example of the kind of the, the range, the visual and content range of these collections, I hope that just gives you a flavor. Um, uh, I think what's also important is that to remember that they're not just visually beautiful. They're, these were also objects which were in use. So they tell us a lot about uh, actual, you know, how Jewish life was taking place in, and how Judaism was being practiced in different places. Um, this is also from the Kennecott collection and Ashkenazi Humash. And what's rather wonderful about it is that you can see um, the writing here, the, uh, the, 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 the different ownership, um, 
in bits of information here beyond the text, you have the names of the owner's children. At one point, he names three of his children who were born during the time that he was the owner of this Homage. And then later on, you have the, the names of the censors, of various Italian censors, who were themselves Jewish converts, which also tells you something about the kind of pressures that Jewish people were living under um, in Italy uh, at, at this particular time. So the manuscripts kind of, they have, the, they, the fact that they were being used also tells us a lot about um, how, how Jewish life was happening in different places. So you have some collectors who are really focusing on Ashkenazi material, some were focusing on Sephardi material, and some were just collecting absolutely everything. <laughs> um, so they were, they were very, um, not, not indiscriminate isn't the right word, but they were very um, eclectic in their interests, um, very scholarly um, and very knowledgeable and just very, very curious. This was a, in the 17th century particularly, this was a really burgeoning field of, of study and uh, people like Robert Huntington, um, uh, Selden, Lord, were really hungry to get their hands on this material so that it could enhance their own scholarship and their own understanding. Um, so just actually, let me just kind of pause a moment and just say, I, I mentioned earlier that one of the things that was really important to us in this book was to tell the stories of the collectors. So collectors often get rather kind of left out of the picture. They're these kind of invisible people that unless you're in the collecting business, you never really know about. Um, even though I've lived and worked in Oxford for 30 years, taught at Oxford University, I um, didn't know who the people were who these collections are named after. So Pocock, Selden, Canonici, um, Michael, they were not names that actually meant anything to me. And I thought, well, if they mean nothing to me, there's a good chance they're not going to mean much to, to a lot of other people out there. Um, so telling the stories of these people, these amazing individuals, you know, really remarkable individuals, not necessarily likable individuals, but certainly remarkable individuals, telling their stories as part of who, who they were, why they were collecting, not just what they were collecting, why they were collecting and, and um, what, what the reason for their collecting was as well, was, was a very, very, very important part. So each chapter focuses on one collection but it also um, talks about the collector. Um, so who were these collectors? Well, um, let me see if I can go on, move on to a slightly more interesting image for you to look at. Um, uh, well, okay, so um, actually this is not a very good one to go, go to at the moment, so I'll just go back to this so you've got something pretty to look at. So Canonici, for instance. Um, Canonici was a um, Jesuit priest living in the, um, uh, what trained as a Jesuit priest, living in the 18th century, sort of middle of the 18th century, he was born in 1727. Um, and he was, he was a businessman, basically. He was a, he was a collector, but he was also a dealer. Um, he trained as a priest, but he became a passionate book and art dealer in the 70s and 80s. He lived between Venice, Parma and Bologna. Um, and the reason he became a dealer rather than a true collector was because he had no money. And in one of his letters, he said, I am tied up like a dog and I'm always broke. And he was complaining because he didn't have enough money to buy some, some manuscript that he wanted. The fact is, is he did manage to buy a lot of very precious manuscripts and he left to his heirs thousands of printed books and manuscripts in many different languages um, written between the 8th and the 18th centuries. And he had a particular passion for Bibles, in fact, in all possible languages. Um, so a very different kind of collector was Archbishop Lord. Now, William Lord was the first big uh, the first big collector and he was he lived in the 17th century um, but so about 100 years before he was about he was the century before uh, Canonici sorry Canonici was 18th century I should have said 1727 um, Lord was a century before very powerful very in in influential person in Britain at that time in England at that time he was the Bishop of London he was the Chancellor of Oxford he was the Archbishop of Canterbury he was also very good at making enemies um, and was eventually had his head chopped off uh, in, the tower, in the Tower of London for high treason. Um, but he was a really, he was a political animal. So if you have Kananichi, who's there kind of like, you know, wanting to, wanting to make money, wanting to collect these things and make money from them, buying and selling. Um, you have Lord, who's got a very different purpose. My Archbishop Lord is motivated by politics and religion. He wants to enhance um, his version of Christianity through this great intellectual arms race, gathering manuscripts to Oxford University for the prestige of the university, but also for political purposes to make sure that the church that he was, um, he was feeding uh, had the views that he wanted. 
So he wasn't a Judeophile, but he was passionately interested in Hebrew manuscripts um, for the purposes that he and his, his supporters and followers could put them to. Um, he, during his time as Chancellor of Oxford, he doubled the size of the Bodleian collection in just five years. Um, a quarter of all of the acquisitions were in Oriental languages. And he also, I should say, endowed the first chairs at Oxford in Arabic and in Hebrew. So a completely different character from Canonici. Um, and then you have someone like Robert Huntington, who's the one I'd like to have sat down to supper with. Uh, Robert Huntington, who was also, um, uh, well, he was a, a scholar in the 17th century, also Oxford, taught by Pocock, um, close contacts with Lord. Um, he spent time in Aleppo as the chaplain to the English Levant Company, um, where he clearly had great fun. He was running around, he was having going to parties, he was hunting, um, he was obviously a very sort of a sociable character. Um, he knew lots of people personally in the Jewish communities in Aleppo and Damascus. Um, Aleppo at that point had the Jewish, the biggest Jewish community in the Ottoman Empire. Um, and, you know, it was a very wealthy, prosperous place. But Huntington, so Huntington actually did have a genuine interest in Jewish scholarship in its own right. And he amassed a massive collection, personal collection that reflects the diversity of his interests. Um, but he was also collecting books for people back in uh, for Lord back in England, so though he was he was he was being tasked to find certain things, and then he would go out and find them, and then he'd bring them back. And I think that's another important point about these collections is um, these collectors weren't working. Most of them weren't working in isolation. They couldn't have done. They were working in in these very dense collaborations of people spread sort of all over the world, and we see this again and again and again. So. Um, one of the other very interesting collectors, uh, I, in my, to my mind, I'm just going to, uh, if I can, move you on to, oh, we now seem to have got stuck on Rashi, but okay. Um, so, okay, so actually I'm just going to go back one um, to this, this guy, Kennicott. I think I showed you this earlier. Now, Kennicott, this is like a very uninteresting page visually, which is interesting in itself because Kennicott's collection actually can, contains the most visually beautiful books in the whole of the Bodleian. Um, Kennicott was an interesting guy. He was, um, he was the son of a, a, a barber um, in Totnes in Devon, very rural, sort of you know, unglamorous part of England. Um, and he made his way up to become one of the most prominent biblical scholars in Georgian England. He was an 18th century figure. Um, he had this kind of vision, which was to uh, do a sort of big data study of the Hebrew Bible. Um, and he really dedicated his entire life to this purpose. So he wanted to identify and collate all known manuscripts of the Hebrew Bible in British and Irish libraries and as far beyond as possible. His search took him to America as well um, in order to show that the, the Greek versions of the Bible were better than the Hebrew versions. So he's an interesting, it's a very interesting collection because what he was collecting was actually quite inimical to Jewish interests in a lot of ways but as a result he preserved these fantastically beautiful Bibles and we'll see some of them in a minute. Um, so he was you know he was a sort of mono monomaniac really he had one big vision and he dedicated his whole life to it so you all you have some, so he's very again very very different person. Um, let's move on a little bit now to Oppenheim we don't get any Jewish collectors interestingly enough until, um, well, they, we don't, there are no Jewish collections arriving in the Bodleian Library until we get to the 19th century. Um, and the first big collection, it belongs to David Oppenheim, chief rabbi of Prague. I'm sure his name will be familiar to many of you. Um, Oppenheim um, was in a way a kind of mixture of the people we've talked about in the sense that he was both collecting for the sake of collecting and building up this, he wanted to build up a, a library of Jewish books. He wanted, he had a Phenomenal. Joshua Toplitsky has a brilliant chapter in the book about, you know, Oppenheim and what motivated him. And he really wanted to have the biggest library of Jewish books in existence. <laughs> that was his plan. Um, and but it was also a working library for him as a as a rabbi, as a scholar. He referred to his books. He used them all the time, not just for his own intellectual interest, but also so that he could advise and adjudicate on issues that were coming up um, in the communities that he was um, he was overseeing. And he was also inundated with letters from scholars saying, how do I understand this? What do you think of this? And so he was a very active, he was actively using his library. It wasn't just gathering dust on the shelves. 
And one of the things that was remarkable about Oppenheim is that from the very start, he knew what he was doing. He knew that his vision was to create this massive library of Jewish manuscripts and books. And he had a catalogue from the start. So he was, had an organising principle for his collection right from the start. And this is what you're looking at here. It's a page from Oppenheim's uh, ca uh, catalogue. Um, there's the, his books, although, he, although Oppenheim actually um, was born in 1664 in Worms and he died in 1749, his, no, there were no buyers for his collection, which was really tragic and, and kind of seems extraordinary, but of course it is often the case. And there are still Jewish, man, Jewish collections being broken up as we speak, I'm sure. But um, so what happened with Oppenheim's fabulously kind of valuable, in all senses valuable collection, was it got, um, it got broke, it, it, it got sort of, bro it couldn't find a seller, so it got broken up. And then what happened to it was that the, um, the it got put up for sale, sorry, it got put up for sale. And what happened to it then was that the, the Bodleian bought it and they bought it um, for an absolute song. They paid 2,080 pounds for it in 1826. So almost, almost a century after Oppenheim died. And in fact, the Oppenheim's collection of 34 crates of manuscripts and books sat in storage for almost 80 years before it finally reached uh, safety in Oxford. Um, who was actually making these collections? Well, um, Jewish scribes. Um, and as we've seen, they were using a, a variety of styles and responding to artistic styles and techniques used by other people. And there were also um, Jewish collaborations. So you get in some cases with the Sephardi manuscripts, um, you get these uh, clear sort of scribal families um, and scribal colleagues. And you can see influences moving from text to text. And uh, Theodore Dunkelgrun, Dunkelgrun writes very, very well about that in the Kennecott, the chapter on the Kennecott collection, how these Bibles, you can see visual uh, and scribal uh, influences, um, sort of fashions almost, if you like. Um, but this, um, the, the, the manuscripts in the Michael collection are also interesting. Michael was the other, Herman Michael was the other Jewish collector, big Jewish collector, came after Oppenheim and really um, was a keen um, advocate of the, the science of Judaism, um, friend of Leopold Zuntz. And he was, um, he was very keen to have a collection to rival Oppenheim's. So he was quite consciously collecting to rival Oppenheim. We don't actually know a huge amount about him, about where his money came from or why he had this interest. Um, but we, we do know a few things that he wrote um, in which he stated uh, what his goals were. And he did indeed make a, put together a, a, a phenomenal collection. And a lot of it's Ashkenazi material um, from the Middle Ages. Um, and manuscripts like this one, the Michael, the tripartite matzo from the Michael collection are interesting because of the ways that they've, they've, they've stirred up a lot of debate amongst scholars about the collaboration or not, um, close collaborations or not so close collaborations between Christians, Christian artists and Jewish scribes. Mm -hmm. So here you have the, the first page of the era of Yom Kippur, Kol Nidre, um, very solemn kind of moment with these very, very noisy illustrations of horns blowing and serpents fighting and hissing and um, all sorts of things going on here. Um, so some people have interpreted this as saying that the scribe, that the illustrators didn't really know what they were illustrating. And other people have said, no, 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 there's lots of image, there's lots of symbolism in these images, um, which, which is completely appropriate. So you can carry on kind of arguing it out as you want. But, um, but it's interesting that, that, that what is clear is that there's a sort of area that we don't really quite know enough about still, but these manuscripts kind of are very tantalizing in what they ask us, the questions they raise. Um, um, I'm just, so here's a detail, the de just a more detailed version of that picture. Um, here's another example from the Lord collection, uh, um, an Ashkenazi matzo, also from Germany, Ashkenazi, 13th century. And here you have this figure of the, um, this, well, well, it's interesting, a couple of interesting things about here. First of all, their faces, which are birds' faces, um, they're animal faces, they're not um, human faces, appropriately, as you'd expect. Um, but you have here the, the he, Jewish scribe writing in Hebrew and with his uh, pointed hat on, which is again a, a kind of marker. Um, interesting question about whether that um, is a, a Jewish, a, an image of a Jew by a, a, a Jewish uh, illustrator or, or not. Um, it's also, it also relates to the text itself in quite interesting ways. 
Um, it's just, again, here's a more detailed version for you. Um, here's another example from, from the Michael collection again, an Ashkenazi matzor with the liturgical hymn for the weekly portion, Shekala. And it's, um, what's interesting about this, Shekalim, sorry, what's interesting about this is, as you can see, the image is the wrong way up. And this again has raised suggestions that um, the, I don't know if I've got detail of it, there you go. So the, the, the text um, and the image are obviously, and the, and the image, the illustrations are, don't, don't match. So the suggestion is that the, the, whoever did the illustrations didn't know um, to read Hebrew right to left. Um, there are other interpretations of why it's like this and it may, there are some some scholars believe it's intentional so it's it's not a, it's not it's not it's not done and dusted this debate by any means okay um so this is an example of of one of the kind of these very very beautiful bibles uh in the kennicott collection um and this one was made in the corona la corona the iberian peninsula in the sort of 15th century uh pretty much around the time of the inquisition um, and the, the just the incredible detail and beauty of this of this manuscript page um, is just you can just feast your eyes on it for a long time. But it's um, but as I said, what's interesting is that Kennicott was collecting these Bibles for a reason um, that was not particularly friendly to to uh, to Jews, and yet by collecting them, he's preserved them. Uh, and we have other other examples of this from other collectors in in the in the Bodleian. Um, I just wanted to show you a couple of, of the, these very lovely Italian manuscripts, again, because of the, what they tell us about Jewish life at, um, at the times that these manuscripts were made. Um, not just diversity within the Jewish, uh, the, the, the global Jewish community, but also diversity uh, and interaction, um, in, sorry, not diversity, interaction with the communities in which they were part. So when you look at a, a, a manuscript like this, which is a legal code, the Abba Turim by Jacob ben Asher, made in the 15th century, sort of, uh, 1437 to 1438, I think. Um, what's obviously so striking about this is just how Italian it looks. So you have these very beautiful uh, sort of classics or just what you'd expect of an Italian Renaissance, Renaissance Italian manuscript um, in a Jewish context. Um, and this rather nice Italian landscape in the back of the image. Uh, there's another detail of it. It's a, a Jewish wedding and the, the legal code in this manuscript re refers to uh, the rules about marriage and divorce. But again, there's just de delightful um, images which, you'd, which would sit in any, any um, Renaissance Italian manuscript at that time. So these kind of cultural interactions uh, also tell us that actually Jewish life wasn't separated and segregated at this point in Italy. It might not have been easy and happy all the time, but it was, um, there was a lot of cultural flow, should we say. This is another um, example of a Pentateuch from the Canonici collection, a uh, tiny bit later. And here, um, I don't know if you can see the detail at the top of the page, there's a unicorn. There's a naked Adam and Eve um, and the serpent with a female face. And then here you have the, the unicorn, the lady and the unicorn, with a very Christian iconography of purity and virginity. Um, why? Well, it's probably um, a reference to the patrons of the, the person who commissioned this, uh, this manuscript, this Pentateuch. Um, so the, the Christian iconography creeping in here it's not a Christian in intent. It's a it's a it's a way of acknowledging uh, patrons. So it's a, it's again a compl quite a complicated story. Here's a more detailed picture of that with the two unicorns. And um, actually, I'm not sure. I just said two unicorns, but this one isn't a unicorn. This one's a unicorn here. It's a very fine unicorn horn. Um, and he, you know, again, you wouldn't really expect to see this given the the prohibition on images of faces and people but there it is so they run against um, tradition often these manuscripts this is another very beautiful one from the Kennicott collection um, just keeping on the time um, and what's again very interesting here is incredibly playful um, doesn't fit into any particular category it's a really a, a sui generis it's his own thing and um, this is the colophon the artist's colophon saying you know who, who he was and who he who he wrote when he wrote the the the, the the Bible and 
the, the text when he's when it was described when it was the work was made um, and you can see just these just he's just having great fun I mean he's just it's tremendously inventive it's um, as I said it's playful it's probably quite there's probably all sorts of embedded jokes in here which I don't I don't get but there's also some surprising elements like the figure of the naked women here and here and the faces as well human faces so um, sorry so um, <clears throat> So the, the, the somebody's phone, not my phone, it's not my phone. Um, so these manuscripts tell many different stories and, um, and they're surprising and they're, some of them are very um, as we would expect and some of them are very not as we would expect. I think this is an example of a page which is actually you think, oh wow, so where's this come from? Um, and it, it has, it has, it's, it's, it speaks in, on lots of different levels. You can look at it on lots of different levels. You can read it on lots of different levels. Um, I think the um, I think I want to kind of leave time for questions, really. But the other thing I wanted to say um, was that what these manuscripts also show is um, that they um, the that they change their meanings over time. And the life that they had and the meaning that they had when they were first collected is not the same as the meaning they have now. Um, and the way that they're read now is not the same. One of the other really important collections in the, in the Bodleian Library is the um, Geniza collection. Okay. So, which obviously was collected by uh, Jewish people um, and was also preserved by Jewish people. So that you have this great battle uh, when, the, when these, man when these fragments of manuscripts first begin to emerge in the 19th century um, and Solomon Schechter in Cambridge University realizes that there's something really important here. Adolf Neubauer who, in Oxford, um, the sub-librarian at Bodleian at the time, um, there's, this, there's this incredible competition between these two men to get, get the, uh, the uh, fragments from the, from the Geniza and Neubauer in particular in Oxford didn't want fragments, he wanted proper kind of chunky, substantial, scholarly things, whereas Solomon Schechter in Cambridge was collecting absolutely anything. Eventually, um, the, two, the two universities came together, and in fact, recently, they, they've been digitized thanks to the Polonsky Foundation, and now there's open access um, to both what, it, what there is in both. But in Oxford, there are 4,000 fragments from the Cairo Geniza, um, 25,000 pages, um, including the oldest dated copy of the Babylonian Talmud, 20 pages of autographed draft of the mission of Torah and everything else from rabbinic commentaries to shopping lists. Um, and one of the, one of the detail, one of the little fragments in the Bodleian library that I particularly like um, is a, it's a fragment, which is a deed of sale by a, of a property for, by a Christian to a Jew on one side, repurposed as a poem uh, by a fifth century Jewish, uh, to copy out a poem by a fifth century Jewish poet and then repurposed again on the reverse to note the omens of the weather, noting that thunder in Scorpio will lead to miscarriages in women, death of horses and fish, lots of cumin and not much rain. So on that note, I think um, I will stop talking and let you ask questions, which I'll, Martin and I will try and answer. But I just I think I hope that's given you a taste of kind of the, the riches within these the collections at the Bodleian. Um, and also a, a, a small taste of kind of the extraordinary collectors who, who, who made these collections possible. So I shall come out of my screen share now. The, the, this is really extraordinary. Thank you so much, this, Rebecca. This is, this is just beautiful. Thank you for bringing this to us and with, all, with showing us many of the manuscripts and, and Gorgeous, just gorgeous. Um, I'd like to remind everybody that uh, you can ask your question live by raising your hand um, or possibly sending me a note. Um, by the way, there are a lot of notes um, in the chat thanking you for this tremendously extraordinary uh, achievement of putting this together. Um, and uh, let's see, we have, uh, I'll ask some questions in the chat from the chat until we uh, have uh, some people raising their hands. Um, uh, if you want to raise your hand, there's a button at the bottom of, either at the bottom of your screen or you can press the participants button and you'll find it in there. Um, 
let's see, I guess uh, Sanford and Doreen Turbo are asking, why is he wearing a pointed hat? <laughs> Um, I think that was um, one of the medieval, um, uh, the, the were, Jews were required to have like, wear identifying um, clothing or identifying marks and one of the distinctively Jewish uh, things that, that, that pieces of clothing that Jews wore was a, was a pointed hat. You can see the same thing actually in um, Winchester Cathedral, there's a chapel which, is, which has uh, pictures of, of Jews from the same period uh, and they're also wearing pointy hats. So it was, it was just one of the things that, that Jews wore. You yeah. allowed you to identify them as Jews. Uh -huh. oh, so that was not worn by the general population? No. 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 Okay, so then um, Elisa Lipschitz, it looks like it, is asking, saying so fascinating, and then she's asking, what is the approximate market value of some of, some of these items? I, I imagine that- Lisa, are, are you thinking of buying them, Lisa? <laughs> <laughs> um, I have no idea. I have no idea. Um, I mean, the market value changes all the time, but, uh, but in any case, I, I, I don't know. And I think as we've seen with the, as we see with the Oppenheim collection, you know, he, that was a phenomenally valuable collection, which had no, no market value at the time that his family tried to sell it. So market value changes, I, I, there's not, that's way out of my area of expertise. <laughs> and somebody asked actually why Devon, why I call Devon unglamorous. I don't mean really unglamorous. I just mean kind of, it's, it's not a, it wasn't a sort of, cosmopolitan civilized um, hotspot like, like Oxford at that time. Devon was a rural backwater. And this, this guy, you know, Benjamin Kennicott kind of emerged out of it and just became such a big mover and shaker. So that's why, that's why I, I call it unglamorous. It's probably not fair to, to Devon, you're right. Okay, and then um, Roberta, Roberta Strike, Stretchler um, is asked, I hope I pronounced that right, somewhat, <laughs> somewhat right. Uh, asks, are there other examples similar to Yosef Chaim using people and animals to write letters? Um, well, that's a very good question. And I think um, there is, yes, I think in the Kennecott collection, I'm right in saying that there is another Bible which also uses this same style of colophon, um, but it's but because of this, these scribal families and scribal influences. Um, I don't know, I think it's pretty much uh, I, I think it's quite unique though to this um, this particular scribe um, it's not common um, but it is so the, this 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 particular way of doing it I think um, using people and animals there are in the collections altogether the the, the the illustrations the illuminations do often use people and animals but not necessarily to write letters what you do also get those you get micrograph micrographia which is this tiny 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 writing um, where which doesn't look like writing and unless you, you look at it through through a, um, a magnifying glass but it is in fact writing so you, you get lots of playful um, inventive ways of combining image and text um, and using letters to make pictures and pictures to make letters so you, you, um, yes although not exactly in in this way that this this man does it um it's, I, have, I have a question which is um, is there any, some of this is just so gorgeous. Is there any thought of also printing some of this in sort of print form that people could, I mean, this, some of these manuscripts are something that people might like to put on, you know, on their wall as, as a, you know, as, as, as an illustration or also um, printing entire manuscripts, uh, the book, you know, the book of, of an entire manuscript. Um, Marty, would you like to answer that question? <laughs> um. Well, the answer to how much they're worth is that the answer to that is a lot of money um, <laughs> and they're priceless. But um, I don't really know the answer to that question about, um, you know, I mean, what I thought someone was asking, at least in the first beginnings of hearing the question, was are for, should the Bodleian gift shop, for example, create <laughs> posters with images of some of these manuscripts as the content of the poster? And I will, I will um, raise that question with the powers that be. Uh -huh. But it's a very interesting idea. And if there was more to that question, which I thought there might have been, maybe uh, if that person could re-ask the rest of it. I okay. thought, I thought that actually what she was asking, maybe I'm wrong, was whether there's any, whether there's any, any plan to, Liz, it's your question, wasn't it? Whether there's a plan to make any facsimile editions. Yes. Take any of the manuscripts and turn them into actually books you can actually buy now. 
Um, the answer to that is, um, well, there's two answers to that. The first is the answer to the Kennecott Bible is yes, there's a plan to do that. Although the facsimile edition um, will contain portions of it because the Bible itself is very, very large and it would be a very long facsimile. Mm -hmm. So there is something that is being done that um, talks about the Kennecott and will have um, essays on the book as well as pieces of it that would be a part of a facsimile. The second thing is that um, while it's not producing a facsimile, is that we are in the process of raising money, the Bodleian is raising money, um, to digitize many of these works. Um, I know Rebecca already mentioned, I think it was the Polanski Foundation that is working on some of them. I don't know what that complete list is. So um, while there is a difference between a facsimile, which is a book, and a digitized uh, and accessing digitized images of each of the pages, there is a difference there. We, the, the library is in fact working to digitize many of many, if not all of these works, so that you could literally be sitting at your kitchen table or anywhere else and put them on your iPad and look at them. And, and we, should, we should also say that, um, you know, the, there are, there's a lot of material in the, uh, in the Bodley and Ju Judaica collections, as well as in the library, the college library, the college library collections, right. which are part of Oxford University, which haven't been digital, haven't really been, they haven't been studied yet, because there's so much there. So there's a very interesting collection by Katzenberg Bergen, who, which really, really needs, um, really needs supporting so that people can actually get in there and look at the manuscripts, photograph them, study them, find out, catalog them, find out what's there. Um, there, there's, a, there's a lot still to be done. I mean, it's a tremendously large and rich um, uh, library collection. And um, really, these, 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 these collections that we've written about, um, that it's not, not scratching the surface, that's not fair, but, the, but there, are, there, are, there are treasure troves still to, to, to dig into in there. Um, somebody asked the question, um, is there a catalog listing of all the books and manuscripts available for one to look up? Um, there's a, there is the Neubauer catalogue, which was um, made by Adolf Neubauer, and which is, uh, has been updated since, I think. So that's the main catalogue. It's still in use. Um, there is, presumably there is also catalogues. Um, I'm not quite sure what you wanted to use it for, but yes, there are catalogues, yeah. Okay, and an another question which I have is, um, you know, as you referred to briefly um, at the beginning of your talk about uh, you know, many of the times when manuscripts were destroyed, Jewish manuscripts were destroyed. I guess one example would that of that would be Louis the Fourteenth in twelve forty two ordering the burning of Jewish books and manuscripts, which you know was a real disaster. But we're, I was wondering if any of these collections, uh, uh, collectors specifically, um, were rescuing uh, manuscripts from these kinds of, you know, mass burnings or orders, uh, to burn, to burn, uh, Jewish manuscripts? Um, uh, I don't think they were necessarily rescued specifically from, uh, people who were attempting to destroy them, but certainly, um, for example, during the Thirty Years' War in Northern Europe, um, there were a lot of there was a lot of pillaging of libraries of, pri of private libraries as well as institutional libraries and um, at that point uh, people would have taken material um, stolen material uh, stolen manuscripts and taken them um, and so then sold them on later or given them to their benefactors or whatever so um, that they there was a there were a lot of books were collected from places that would have been destroyed otherwise and they um, they then ended up being collected, so there are books in the manuscripts in the in the uh, the uh, Bodleian, which were plundered during the Thirty Years' War, some decades or sometimes centuries earlier, which have ended up in the Bodleian. Um, the other example is of um, the Mantuan Jews, who had a very very large collections collections of manuscripts and books. Um, I mean, throughout throughout European history, you find this this um, Jewish Jewish people valuing their books. Um, they were often given as part of uh, of, the, of a wedding dowry. They were often part of the collection, uh, part of the um, assets and the estate of a Jew when they died. With their, their books, they would give books as gifts. Um, so where these went is a big question. But in the case of the Mantuan Jews, we do know that they, when the Jews were expelled from Mantua. Mantua um, they're, they're, there were hundreds of their books were, were confiscated, as all their property was confiscated, including their books. Um, and 
some of these have ended up in the Bodleian for, for, uh, through various kind of complicated routes. So yes, I mean, the, the, they have, the, I mean, there's one thing that to be said is that, you know, the existence of these great national libraries is just so important in preserving knowledge. And knowledge can't really be owned at one level, but the preservation of the, the, the forms in which knowledge is, is written down is so important. Um, and I, I love the fact that, you know, that even the people who are collecting these manuscripts couldn't control what was done with the knowledge they contained. They could control the object, they could bring it into their possession, they could sell it to a library, they could hide it, they could do whatever they wanted to with it. But the knowledge that the manuscript contains has a kind of freedom. And it, 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 there's something kind of rather beautiful about that to me um, and very important at this moment in time as well to remember that. Uh, can I just add, add something to that? Um, there is a book called um, Burning the Books by Richard Ovenden and mm -hmm. Richard Ovenden is the current head of the Bodleian Library at Oxford. Okay and what's amazing about this book is that going back to Mesopotamia all through the Nazis and after it discusses all different historical episodes where knowledge was attacked and books were burned, okay? There was an estimate that there were 100 million Jewish books destroyed in the Holocaust. If there were 6 million Jews, that's 15 per Jew, and that doesn't count what was in libraries, okay? And two of the most incredible things about the digitization project, um, which I hope I won't get into trouble with more re-mentioning that, you know, we're raising money, the Bodleian's raising money for that, is that two things are accomplished when you digitize the book. Digitization, or if anybody doesn't know what it means, it basically means you take a picture of each page and it's now in the web, in the cloud. And the first thing that you do is it's no longer destructible. Now that it has to take care of things, but it's basically the images are not able to be burnt because they're on everybody's computer screen and been downloaded. The second thing is that it completely democratizes knowledge because anybody anywhere can go on their iPad in their kitchen table or wherever they are and just look at them. So you don't have to go to Oxford to study them. But um, I, as I was reading his book, I wasn't aware, and Rebecca, you'll correct my history here, um, but I think it was in the 1500s um, that there was massive destruction of books in England. Um, and was it by the, um, the Protestants destroying Catholic books, did I get that right? That's okay. exactly right. So there was an incredible number of Catholic, of books, of Catholic books, books in churches, Catholic churches in England in the 1500s, I think it was, um, that were destroyed by Prot English Protestants. So we shouldn't think that um, Jews were the only people whose books were destroyed by non-Jews. There were many Christians who destroyed Christian texts because they were from different sects. So I just mentioned this book to you, Burning the Books by Richard Ovenden. It talks about Mesopotamia. It talks about how libraries have been destroyed because people thought that by destroying the library, you're basically destroying one of the great symbols of the national ethos of the people you were fighting. Okay, um, when um, 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 uh, Catholics came into um, Spain, they very often tried to destroy Hebrew or Muslim manuscripts written in Arabic. Um, so the, the attacking of books um, of, of one people by another people is not something that, you know, Jews held, held a special pride of place for. Um, but um, uh, they, did have, they did have their pride of place, but it wasn't, it wasn't an exclusive club. So I just mentioned the burning the books because it talks, this is all about preserving knowledge. Um, and um, this book talks about the history of the destruction of knowledge. It's also, let me just leave that comment. It's a, it's a it's a really important point actually because it, it was the fact that the the Protestants had been um, had destroyed and burned public burnings of so many Catholic manuscripts or manuscripts with a Catholic taint as they put it in the, the just in the century before Thomas Bodley, which was why Oxford University didn't have a proper library because the library had there had been a library but it had been sort of destroyed really by these this cultural cleanup. I mean, that's a positive gloss, you know, it's not how we see it now, but they saw it as a cultural cleanup. Um, and Thomas Bodley, who was himself a Protestant, was actually horrified by this because he was, he was, he did not approve of burning books. Um, and he, he, he came, you know, he, when he realized what a terrible state the Bodleian Library was in, or the Oxford University Library was in, that's when he came up with the idea 
to set up a new university library, um, which then was the one that we have. Um, so, so yes, it, it's exactly because of uh, Christians burning other Christians' books that, that, that there was a need for, for a, univer a, new, a new library in Oxford. I should also say that, you know, I mentioned that Kennicott was collecting Jewish manuscripts, um, was collecting Jewish manuscripts in, for, for a sort of, let's, I mean, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure we can say anti-Semitic, but it certainly wasn't judo, ju, ju, judeophilic purposes, but, um, but he wasn't the only one. There's a collection, the Reggio collection, which was by a rabbi called Rabbi Reggio. Um, he was collecting Kabbalistic texts in order to disprove the validity of Kabbalah. Now, um, in fact, what has happened as a result of that is that he's, he's, he preserved very, very important Kabbalistic texts, which are now kind of the subject of very you know, keen scholarly interest. So yes, I mean, it's not, um, it's, it's not an us versus them in this, the history of knowledge. There are plenty of people who do, do bad things when it comes to, to knowledge and books and manuscripts. And we're just incredibly grateful that the Bodleian is, has, has, this, has preserved this supreme resource. And yeah, I think there was a quote by Michael, was it? where it talks about this, these Bodleian collections um, as being monuments created by Jews, but preserved by non-Jews. <laughs> so the, in, the, the, the interplay here between uh, Christian Hebraists who wanted to collect these texts because they wanted to study the Bible and religion. Um, and as Rebecca said earlier, they, they didn't do it out of a love for Jews. Um, they basically did it because they were interested in Hebrew and the Bible and the language, but nevertheless, the result was the saving of these documents. And if you just contrast what happened in Europe, um, what the Germans did to Jewish books and what the British did to Jewish books and Hebrew books, you can see two very different cultures at work. Enough said. It was seen. It was seen as very tragic, wasn't it, when the when the Oppenheim collection and the Michael collection couldn't find buyers in Germany. And it was, it, there, there was much lament, really deep sorrowing and lamenting about that, that these great collections didn't stay in Germany. But of course, you know, the irony is that had they stayed in Germany, they might have been destroyed forever in the 20th century. So it's, uh, it is, it's a complicated story, but I really would urge, you know, if this, if, if this has whetted anyone's appetite, <laughs> I really would urge you to, to read the book because the, 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 the scholarship, but also the knowledge and the stories of these manuscripts and the people who collected them and what happened to them in each chapter in the book is, is um, it, they're written by people who really know each of these collections in much more detail than I do and who tell the stories wonderfully. So I would really, and, the, and also that just, I've just shown you a tiny, tiny fraction of the images. There are 140 color plates. So I've shown you what 10. Uh, so there's, a, there's, there's so much more in the book. Yeah, and what, like one it. of the great things about the way the scholars have written the chapters is that this, the chapters are written by great scholars um, with great scholarship, but they were not written for the purpose of being in an academic journal only to be read by other scholars. They were written with the um, idea in mind and the purpose in mind that the reader is gonna be members of the general public. Not highly technical things that would only interest academics. Uh, thank you, do, do we have time for one more question? Um, I guess there, there's a question uh, about, is there a cooperation with the Nat uh, National Library of Israel, especially in the realm of digitizing manuscripts? Um, at the last question and then we'll do, uh, do you know the answer to that Marty I don't actually know the answer I imagine there is there's great collaboration between all the yes. great libraries sorry there, Marty. There, there, there is collaboration I don't know the parameters of all of it but I think that there is a project right now that is trying to and I'm not sure who's I think it's the National Library of Israel who's behind it but I'm not 100% sure and if so it's in collaboration with others that they're trying to get a single database that will list every single Hebrew manuscript um, uh, it, that is known. So every, every Hebrew manuscript, I think it's called the Kativ Project, but I, I double check on that, um, where they're trying to uh, have a single database to identify where in what institution or in, in whose hands every ex extant Hebrew manuscript currently is. That's, that, that is phenomenal. Well, thank you both. I'd like to urge everybody to uh, purchase this beautiful, beautiful book. Um, it's it's really, really a phenomenal book. And I, thank you both for coming here. Um, I will um, give you both a chance if you have any final words for, for everybody. Oh, let me first mention what our um, 
uh, our upcoming, our, our next uh, uh, book club will be uh, next Wednesday, uh, the Trayvon hoax. We'll be sending out an email about that um, next Wednesday at 1 p.m. Hope to see many of you there. And uh, uh, Rebecca and Marty, do you have any final uh, words? Yeah, someone wants to make, everybody? yeah, the, someone just chatted. The name of the book is Jewish Treasures from Oxford. Oxford Libraries. I think maybe they wanted Richard's book. The name of oh, Richard's, the, oh, Richard's book was called Burning the Books. I'm just going to hold up a copy of uh, and this. Here we are. So you can actually see physically. It's a very That's Jewish treasures. This is Jewish treasures. Which and there's is, Richard's book. And which could be a great coffee table book. It was intended to be a coffee table book. Uh -huh. <laughs> There you go. And, uh, Rebecca, do you have any final? Uh, no, I just, it's just a real pleasure to, to talk to you. And thank you very much for, for giving me this opportunity. And just again, I would just like to, you know, thank you to wonderful benefactors like Marty Gross. You know, we, 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 need, we need more people like, like Marty Gross. <laughs> um, these books, you know, they, 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 don't, they don't necessarily happen without the generosity of people who really have the vision to see why they matter. That's really oh, great. Thank you. Oh, my, my, my co-host, uh, Sharona, uh, just put the link in to, to, to your book on uh, Amazon for people. And we look forward to seeing everyone next week. Please uh, remember to join ZOA and, and help ZOA out so we can continue to bring you these wonderful programs. And thank you again, Marty. Thank you again, Rebecca. And thank you, everybody, for being here. We love you all. <laughs>